so we're here in an unusual, I, I can say, setting. It's a university, but it's in the church building. And we brought 100 plus citizens of Europe to participate and be moderated by you experts in something they call the biggest deliberative process in the EU's history. From your perspective, you're also an expert on game theory above all that expertise that you have. Can this experiment work and in what sense in today's Europe? Well, first of all, there's nothing harder to predict than the future, so we'll see. But it has all the potential because um, indeed it is the first time, there's been hundreds and hundreds, a thousand um, deliberative assemblies, mini publics, you know, around the world in the last 20 years. And it has worked, but it has worked mostly at the local level. You know, cities do that, maybe sometimes region. And of course, a few national ones like in Ireland, Iceland, the French Climate Assembly. So there's been national experiments, but never transnational. Uh, because to start with, you know, here we have 24 languages. Uh, the, those 200 citizens had to be selected from 27 countries with gender diversification, income level, education level. So it's a representative sample, but very diverse, very complicated. So how do the, all these people agree on, at the end of the day, in two days time, 10 recommendations. Now you talk about game theory, and maybe somebody could formalize this, but the citizens probably don't think in these strategic terms. They just pick the proposals that they like best. And what bothers them? Because we live in, in times where emotions are very strong, we see pandemic, we see fear as a dominant emotion of today. So how do you balance this? Use experts and them with their yeah. thoughts? No, and first of all, us experts are, are supp not supposed to give them advice. We're supposed to respond to questions and be neutral about mm -hmm. it. So we don't say, oh, this one is better than that one. And experts are tempted to do this, but um, I know very well that we shouldn't do that. We should just say, well, this is more feasible. This is, feasible. This is something that, um, that, will, that the EU has already done or can't do. So the possibility frontier, this is something you, where you will have a likelihood of, of you know, having support in various places. So we can kind of say that, but basically stay neutral. It's a very big challenge. So the citizens have raised issues like minority rights, like social economic convergence because democracy is not just having a voice but it's also having the capacity to participate and they understand that um, they've raised issues about being confused about the EU how it's explained a common public space fake news a lot of issues in fact um, we have a little booklet with the hundreds of orientations they've come up with and uh, um, now they're studying all these orientations that they came up with uh, three or weeks ago in their second session. We're in the third and last, and we'll see which ones they pick. It's very exciting. Talking about rights and democracy, we are in Florence. Historically, we know what came after the plague, <laughs> the Renaissance, <laughs> they say. We have now a new European Bauhaus. But uh, from your point of view, uh, will we learn something out of this and how Europe will transform at the end? Well, I mean, indeed, uh, I absolutely will learn because we have to explore new innovative forms of democracy in Europe. I don't think there is a choice. Uh, I call it a dem 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 democratic emergency. You know, people will be tempted by more extreme parties and, and might reject the EU altogether if it continues to be obscure in their eyes. Now there's a lot of good things happening, like the Next Generation Fund, the Green Transition, Digital Transition, but they need to feel they're part of it, that it's not this far away thing. They need to be able to, for instance, look at the Next Generation Fund and really observe each project. This is what I call the democratic panopticon. They need to have eyes on what happens. Um, and I hope that this, if anything, this process will be the first of many where we'll have much more um, deeply and uh, designed uh, participatory democracy because it's not as if the EU hasn't done participation. There's a lot of consultation, surveys, etc. But it's remained um, quite small. So this is about scaling up uh, democratic participation. Uh, we agree that we will speak because we are talking about democracy and participation yes. that we will talk on the first names uh, uh, yes, terms. Yes. Calypso, you know, your name gives a lot of meanings if we talk about its meaning and, you know, uh, Greeks and we are now, we can, you know, do, do, do the walk and think in this kind of environment. 
So uh, maybe just uh, for the end, your message uh, to to Europe. Well. Ivana, <laughs> absolutely. I'm called Calypso. I can't hide it. I'm of Greek origin, but also French and British. I have three nationalities, so I feel very European. European yeah. Very European. And indeed, but my name is from ancient Greek mythology. So I think when we talk about the future, the past is a wonderful insp inspiration. You don't reproduce slavishly the past. You know, Athens with Athens, all, all citizens, but not all citizens, not women, not foreigners, not slaves, but okay. Mm -hmm. And Florence Their was version, Florence. And, and then, Florence was yeah. Florence. And here in Florence too, we had the moments of great participation. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Although we also had moments that were regressive. So we look at this past, we ask what mistakes they made, what did they do right, can it inspire us? Can we scale up democracy? Because all of these experiments were very local. So how can we scale up what happened here in, at the Renaissance in Florence without the risk of what happened at the end when, well, the Medici's, you know, kind of dis decided that the Republic shouldn't um, continue forever. So we, history is inspiring, but we are building a future where we have to experiment with new ways of doing things, especially because, you know what, in Florence, Machiavelli, whom I greatly <laughs> admire, did not have the internet and social media. <laughs> and it was very hard to connect with everybody. Mm -hmm. So now we have this amazing tool, which can be dangerous, but it's also a tool that we can exploit for the better. And back to the new generation, they will know how to do it and we have to trust them. So a new digital democracy that is also in physical places. That it's going to be beautiful. So Machiavelli, Dante or Boccaccio, what's the best literature <laughs> for 2022, for New Year's present? Um, I, all of them, really, because they, 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 it's about overlapping worlds and whatever captures your imagination. Because at the end of the day, Ivana, this is all about democratic imagination. What is democracy? Democracy is when citizens imagine themselves as the author of their destiny. Not a king, not an emperor, not a priest themselves. And so if that's the case, if they, it needs to be in their heads first. So that, was, that is, for me, what is democracy. And that means they, the imagination is so important. So if it's Dante, Boccaccio, or if it's Machiavelli, whoever makes them tick is what matters to our citizens, or, or their own thinking. Is the youth aware? We know that the, we are working for the next generation. Everything is called the next generation. And we will have the elections in 2024 where these new generations will go out and vote. We see the participation on the election is not so good on EU elections. How do you see this new generation? Well, you know, the funny thing is, well, not, I mean, the, the challenging thing is one of the many, many orientations that we have on the table for this weekend is to lowering the voting age of at 16. Now, Voting age, all of these things are national competences, but if there's a movement in, in, the, in Europe, the, the EU cannot dictate, oh, you know, France or Portugal, you're gonna, or, or Slovakia, you, you have to lower the, the voting age. But if, if it spreads, the youth will be in the street and asking for it. And I think that's very right, because we, as you were saying, we, we're de deciding their future. Uh, green issues, it's their life. I have kids who are, you know, 20 and 23, so it's a, okay, they're already voting, but I really believe at 16 they could have voted. They're very aware, you know, social media, etc. And um, this is their moment. So I hope this is one of the proposals is, that is going to fly very much. So you're betting on the Renaissance? <laughs> if we bet, yeah, the game theory, you do. Let's bet on the Renaissance. Thank you so much for being our guest. My pleasure.